Hello everybody, welcome to this week's webinar, Analyzing Datasets in Excel with Deborah Ashby. I must admit I'm quite excited about this, having enjoyed Deb's recent live class on how to create engaging PowerPoint presentations and learning a lot. Um, for anybody who doesn't know Deb, she's an IT trainer specializing in Microsoft training and content creation. She's been an IT trainer for nine years and has been supporting Microsoft products for 21. She's an office specialist and a, um, and a Microsoft certified trainer. Uh, she's just been telling me about some of her previous uh, work with Microsoft, which was very interesting to me. Um, and in that case, I think I shall pass you along to her, since she knows a lot more than I do about this subject. Uh, thank you very much, and welcome, Deborah. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, and thank you to James for that wonderful introduction. Um, <laughs> saves me having to introduce myself, which is always good. Um, okay, so today we're going to be taking a look at analyzing data in Excel, and this is quite a large topic, and really it depends um, how much you kind of have to do. This really depends on your job role. There are some job roles which you have to do quite a lot of data analysis, and then others not so much, but a lot of the things I'm going to show you today I think will be useful even outside of analyzing data. They kind of cross over into other parts of Excel as well, so I'm hoping that you're going to get quite a bit out of it. Um, as usual, we've got quite a lot to cover, and I'm just going to pull up an agenda because you don't need to know any more about me, and we're going to this is our rough agenda, so we're going to answer that question, what is data analysis? We're then going to jump in to taking a look at how you clean the raw data, and I'll explain a little bit more about that once we get to it. We're then going to move on to some sorting, so we're going to go through from basic to advanced, how you sort your data, and also some advanced filtering as well, so really extracting out of your raw data or your data list the information that you want to know. We're then going to move on to pivot tables, everybody's favorite thing. We, um, I did a session a few weeks ago purely on pivot tables. I don't know if any of you came to that. And I think pivot tables are one of those things that are really misunderstood. People kind of think that they're really difficult. They're actually super easy to do. So I'm just going to show you how you create pivot tables, some little tricks and tips for really kind of extracting out that data uh, that you need from those. We're going to take a look at some other things. So aside from the, the extraction of data, this session is going to cover a little bit about um, making your data more visual, more interesting for people as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you can use conditional formatting on your data. We're going to take a look at how you create a pivot chart and how you essentially build up a dashboard. You may have heard people, it's sort of been the buzzword in Excel for the past year or so, how you create interactive dashboards, particularly when you're sharing data with other people. So we're going to build up a very kind of basic dashboard. We're going to add in some pivot charts. We're going to add in some things like slices and timeline slices and lots of fun things like that. So we're going to take a look at that. We're going to take a look at some analysis tools. Now, I haven't listed them all out there because I didn't have enough room on the slide, but specifically, we're going to be taking a look at some data analysis analysis tools at, such as Goal Seek, which you may have heard before. We're going to look at scenarios and how you create scenarios and also data tables as well. And then finally, just to end the session, um, a couple of formulas. And I'm fortunate enough that in the office, I sit next to two data scientists and they do a lot of data analysis. So I basically went to them last week and said, hey, what formulas do you use most in your job role? So they came to me and they said, VLOOKUPs and IF statements. So I'm just going to finish the session by going through how you use those as well. The way this session is going to be structured is um, I am going to move fairly rapidly. We only have an hour and quite a lot to cover, um, and I realize that some of you might possibly be taking notes, but just do remember that this session is being recorded, so if you need to go back and review anything at the end, then we'll make that recording available to you. That's not a problem. Um, I've got a couple of slides at the beginning here, and then we're going to jump straight into just some live exercises, and as James said, if you do have questions as we go through, please just pop them into the chat window, and I will adjust, address them. Depending on how we're doing for time, I might stop halfway through, and we'll take some questions, um, or I might uh, leave them to the end. It really depends how we go. All right, without further ado, let's get on to the first slide. So I just wanted to really basically answer this, what is data analysis and why is it so important? 
really all we mean by data analysis is it's the process of inspecting, cleaning, and transforming raw data so it's useful, visual, and easy to interpret for others. Okay, and hopefully some of the tools that I'm going to show you as we go through the session today are going to answer all of those things. So we're going to start out by taking a look at that inspecting part. So looking at your raw data, seeing how we can put it in the best possible format ready for analysis, because that is really, really vital. Um, the first example I'm going to show you, which we'll move on to, let's just come out of here and jump across to Excel. And this is the exercise file that we're going to be using. So I've just got some tabs set up across the, the bottom. I'm using Excel 2016 if anyone is interested. But this, uh, what I'm going to show you is pretty much compatible with 2013 and 2010 as well. So if you're using any of those versions, um, we shouldn't have any kind of issue with the version being different. Okay, so on this first tab here, I have some data. So it's not a huge amount of data. You'll find that those of you that do work with uh, or do a lot of data analysis are probably dealing with huge data sets. Now, that's not really practical for this kind of session. So I do have some data in here. It's got quite a few rows, a little bit of information. The first thing you want to do when you're going about data analysis or you want to do something like a pivot table is you need to really look at the data that you're going to be using. If the data or the raw data as we call it isn't in a good format then you're not going to get a pivot table that's going to be in the correct format. So it's really important that you check your raw data and you clean that data prior to trying to use any of the tools that I'm going to be showing you as we go through the session. Okay. Now, what I mean by that is you can see here my data is perfectly fine looking. Everything's in nice, neat columns, nice, neat rows. I can see that I have in this first column, this is all text. I don't have a combination of text and numbers, so everything looks good there. So my data is pretty much ready to go for a pivot table or any kind of data analysis. But I also realize that we don't live in a perfect world, and you might be given data which isn't in such a perfect state. So it might be that you are using data that's been extracted from a database, so maybe something like Access or some other kind of database. And we all know sometimes data doesn't come in looking perfect like mine looks just here. So I'm going to show you a few little tips and tricks to clean your data essentially or tidy it up, which might help you before we start to do some of these data analysis tools. The first thing you want to make sure you're doing is getting rid of any extra spaces. So you can see here, for example, in column A, I have a list of employee names. Now, if I've typed these in, or maybe these have been imported from an external database, it could be that they've come across with some erroneous spaces in those cells. And what I mean by that is there might be a double space before the, the surname or maybe a double space in between the names instead of just one space. And that can have quite a dire consequence to your data. So you want to make sure that you're removing all of those. And there is a really good little formula which will clean up any kind of spaces that you have in there. Sometimes it's hard to tell, like sometimes I, I've completely missed them because I can't really, it's hard to tell if there's a double space as opposed to a single space. So I would advise that you just do this command anyway regardless so you know that your data is clean of any erroneous spaces. So the way that I like to do it, it's a function called trim. Okay, so depending on how you normally like to do your formulas, there are a, few, a couple of different ways that you can do formulas. You can type them directly into the cell, which is what I tend to do, or you can go to your formulas ribbon, and you can use this insert function command, which you may, again, be a little bit more um, familiar with. So you can search for any command in here just by typing it in. So for example, if we're looking for trim, and click go. And then you can access the formula that way. And if you do it through the insert functions, it's going to give you your functions dialog box, which sometimes if you're still kind of getting used to formulas or learning them, sometimes that's a little bit easier than just typing the formula directly into the cell. Okay. Now I'm going to type it directly in because that's the way that I prefer to do it. So I'm going to type in equals. As we know, an equals always tells Excel you're about to type a formula. So that always goes in there first. We're then going to type in trim. doesn't have to be in capitals. It can be in lowercase. And we're going to do an open bracket, which is fairly standard for formulas. 
Now what you'll see if you are using the method where you type directly into a cell, you'll see you get a little tooltip pop up which kind of tells you what Excel is expecting you to type. So it's saying to me text, so it's saying okay, so what text do you want me to trim? What text do you want me to remove the spaces from? So I'm going to go across to my employee name, the first one here, and I'm going to click in cell A2. And that's all you need to do for this, and then obviously close that bracket up and press enter. And it's going to remove any spaces. I don't think I've got any in here, but if there were, it would make it all nice for you. And then, as with any formula, we can use our autofill handle, and we can drag that formula down so we don't need to type it in again over and over. And another quick way of doing it is if you just hover your mouse over the corner, over the autofill handle, and double click, that will fill them down like so. Okay, then all you would need to do is, again, just take these, copy them, and paste them into your employee names just to make that a little bit easier. Then you're safe in the knowledge that you've got no gaps or no erroneous data in there. Okay, so that is your trim function, a really useful little thing, not just for data analysis, just for, for anything, really, when you're dealing with um, uh, large amounts of text. Another thing related to the text is the, the case of your text. So again, if you've had data come across or imported, you might find that maybe some of your employee names are all in uppercase, some are in lowercase, some are a mixture, and maybe you want everything to be uniform, so either all in uppercase, all in lowercase, or all proper, as we call them. That's the Excel terminology. This, how it looks here, with a, with a capitalized uh, surname and first name, that is proper. Okay, so if I had this name all in lowercase, I would use the, the proper command to make it like it is in cell A3. Okay, so if I want to, and again, this is another little Excel trick which can be quite useful. If you want to change a text string all into uppercase, again, if you type equals, and you just want to type in upper, okay? open bracket, and again, it's asking us for the text, so I'm going to select my cell A2, close my bracket, and it will convert to upper case, and I can then do exactly the same, double click to copy those down. Okay, so I'm sure you can see how that works as well, if you want to change it all to lower case, exactly the same, except you use lower. I'll just go through all of them to show you, like so, down. And as I said, proper, now this is a good example, this is all in lower case. If I wanted to make it so it looks like this again, I would use equals proper. Open bracket, and I'm going to use this one this time, like so. All right, so upper, lower, proper, and that is to quickly convert your, your text to uppercase, lowercase, or a mixture of the two. All right, so some useful little tips in there when dealing with text. Another thing that you need to look out for when before you start um, making pivot tables and analyzing your data is blank spaces in your data. Now, this is particularly relevant to pivot tables. If you have, for example, data that comes across which has a blank row in the middle like that, then your pivot table is not going to work, okay? Because it will either use the data above the blank for the pivot table or the data below the blank for the pivot table. It kind of breaks the data in two. So you need to make sure that all uh, blank rows, blank columns, if they're not needed, then they need to be deleted before you can continue. However, it might be that you have just the odd random blank cell every now and again. So I'm just going to delete out of here, pretend we've got a couple of blank cells like so. So if you find that you've got blank cells, something needs to go in those cells, okay? Even if it's just, if you've got data or if you've got uh, numbers, even if it's just a zero, something needs to go in there, okay? The same thing with text. So even if you just put a dash in there, something has to go in that cell. You can't leave it blank. If you're dealing with a large amount of data, finding all the blank cells and getting those filled in might be quite a time-consuming task. So again, we do have a quick way of finding all the blank cells, and I'm going to show you again another little trick for kind of just getting some information in those cells as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my home ribbon, and right across, if you cast your eyes over to the right-hand side, you'll see right at the end we have a little find and select option. 
Underneath that, we get a little drop-down menu, and you'll see that we have an option for Go To Special. Okay, and this is going to allow us to select blanks. You'll see just here in the middle, we have an option for blanks. So if I select that and click OK, it's going to highlight the blanks in my spreadsheet. Okay, I don't know why it's highlighted that end row. Probably might be where I was clicked. Let me try that again. For some reason, it wants to highlight row I as well. I'm not quite sure why mine's doing that. But it will highlight any blanks that you've got within your data table. What you can do to fill those in quickly, and I think mine's going to go all the way down in row I for some reason. I'm not sure why. But if I wanted to, for example, fill those two blanks in, in column C with a contract, I can start to type contract. Yeah, I think mine thinks it's a part of the table for some reason. <laughs> and then if you wanted to fill in all of those blanks, if you hold down your control key and press enter, it will put that data in all of those blank areas. Okay, so um, try and ignore that row, that column I. I, uh, I think I've actually included that as part of my table, unfortunately, but it should just pick up the blank ones that you've got in there and fill those in with something. So the important part there, control enter to fill them all in in one go. Okay, so that's just another little trick that you have for, for doing things a little bit quicker. Another thing you want to look out for is duplicates in your data as well. So duplicate records. And again, sometimes if you're dealing with a large data set, those are quite hard to spot in your data. But Excel has a tool for finding your duplicates and removing those duplicates as well. So I'm going to go to the data ribbon. And you'll see in the middle group here where it says data tools, we have a remove duplicates option. So I'm going to click Remove Duplicates, and it's going to ask me, where do you want me to remove them from, or where do you want me to look for these duplicates? Okay, so I might want to keep everything selected and look for duplicates across my entire data set, or I might just want to look for duplicate employee names in there and get those removed. So I'm going to unselect all and just search for any duplicate employee names, and I'm going to click on OK. And it's telling me that two duplicates were found, um, 738 were unique values, and it's removed those for me. So I click OK. And I know that's correct because I did add in two duplicates earlier on. Okay, so again, another quick way of removing those duplicates. So those are just a few things for making your data a little bit easier before you then go to start to work with it. Another thing that's really important is to make sure that you don't have combinations of data within the same column. So, for example, columns A and B, these are text columns. I have employee names, I have departments. Column C is a text column. Column D is a date column, and then we move on to some numerical columns. Now, what you can't have is a mixture of the two in the same column. I don't know why you'd want to, it doesn't make logical sense, but you never know, there might be a scenario where you could have text or, or numbers in the same column, and that just again doesn't work when it comes to doing pivot tables and things like that. So just make sure that all of your uh, data is consistent with the, the kind of data that you have in those columns. All right, so once you've got your raw data into a state that you're happy with, we can then start to take a look at some ways of analyzing that data, making it easy for us to pull out exactly what it is that we're looking for. And probably the two most common and probably easiest tools to use uh, would be sorting and filtering. And if you use Excel, you're probably fairly used to these two options already. I'm going to show you um, just the basics of them, and then we're going to move into taking a look at some of the more advanced features of your sorting and your filtering as well. So let's take a look at sorting first of all. So there's a couple of places on the ribbons where you have sort options. So we have some sort options on the home ribbon, right over on the right hand side in that editing group. You've got sort and filter, and you have your sort A to Z and uh, sort Z to A and your custom sort in there. Okay, so the top two would be your basic ascending or descending. This will change depending on the data that, you're cur that you currently have selected. So because I'm in a text column, it's telling me sort A to Z. 
if I click in a, a numerical column, so like this salary column, it will say sort smallest to largest or largest to smallest because it now recognizes that those are numbers. Okay, so that's kind of a slight difference. So aside from your sort options on the home ribbon, if we jump across to the data ribbon, we also have our sort options in there as well. So we have sort A to Z, Z to A, and then our advanced sort, which is essentially the same as the custom sort. So if I want to sort my employees, because at the moment they're all kind of mixed up, if I want to sort them into alphabetical order, I'm going to do sort A to Z like so, just to sort those like that. And I could do the opposite if I wanted to. Very, very simple. And it will sort on the, the column that you select, essentially. So now I'm clicked in department, it's sorting into alphabetical order, ascending, descending, the department instead. Okay, so it really depends what you're trying to extract out. The more advanced sort that you can do is sorting on multiple columns. So it might be that you want to sort by uh, department and then higher date and then salary, either in ascending or descending order. And that is where you would use your custom sort or your advanced sort options, which you can find underneath this button just here. So now this is where you can start to add what we call levels in Excel, so different levels of sorting on your data. So the first thing I might want to do is sort by department. So you can see here it picks up all of my column headings, so I can very easily pick department. I'm going to sort on the values in that column, and I can say how I want that sorted, either A to Z or Z to A. So I'm going to keep that on A to Z. I can then tell Excel, right, I want to do a secondary sort, so I can click Add Level, and it gives me another level which I can then add. So I want to sort by department, and then I want to sort a higher date. And I want to sort on values, and I want to do newest to oldest. And you can carry on adding as many levels as you like, so as many levels of, as you have column headings, essentially. So let's just add one more for fun. I'm going to do a third sort on their new salary. I'm going to use the values, and I'm going to do largest to smallest. Okay, and then I'm going to click OK. And who knows what kind of data we'll get there, but it's uh, performed that sort on my data, and it's sorted things in the order that I've asked Excel to. Okay, so that's your sorting, basic, and your advanced levels of sorting as well. I'm just going to click back in my employee name column, and I'm just going to sort those into alphabetical order. Now, in conjunction with that, and these two always tend to go together, so they're normally you'll find them next to each other, is filtering. And filtering is a great little tool for, again, just pulling out what you want to see and making very large amounts of data a lot more readable, because you can filter out what it is you don't need. Now, again, on this um, table here, there are a couple of ways that you can use filters. So I could go to my data ribbon and click on the filter option, and it will add my filters, and that's those little drop-down arrows at the top of my column headings. What I can then do is when I click these drop-downs, it's going to basically show me everything that I have in there. So it lets you status, for example. So if I click the drop-down, it's showing me that I have people in this list who are contractors, full-time, half-time, and work hourly. So if I only want to see my full-time staff, I can deselect everything and only select full time and click on OK. And it's just going to pull out all of those people that work full time. Okay. Now once you've applied a filter, you can tell that you have a filter on a column because you can now see that you've got the little filter icon there as opposed to a little drop down arrow. And uh, a lot of people say that or people will receive a spreadsheet from someone else and they don't realize that they've got filters, filters applied to columns. So, you know, that's always good to look out for that little filter icon. I could then go in and do a secondary search if I wanted to. So maybe I want to see all the people who work full time in a specific department. So I'm going to deselect them all and I'm only interested in account management and creative. I'm going to click on OK. And there we go. 
Okay, so again, you can use those filters and you can filter out what it is that you want, what it is that you need without getting rid of everything. If you look at the rows that you have here, you can see that they're blue and you've also got quite a few rows missing. So it jumps from row 7, 16, 17, 19, 28. So essentially, the ones that are missing in between are the ones that are hidden. They haven't been deleted. As soon as you remove that filter, those rows are going to come back. And again, you have a couple of ways that you can take filters off. You have a, if you look up on your data ribbon, you have a clear option, which will allow you to clear all of those filters. Or you can clear them individually by clicking on the little drop down and you have a clear filter from department just here and you can clear them that way also. Okay? So nice and simple with filtering. So now we've got our data. Actually, there's one more way that I'm going to show you with regards to filter. I'm just going to jump across to the home ribbon. Another thing that I want to show you, and as you can see, for some reason I do have column I selected as part of the table, which is what is giving me problems. There we go. Let's get rid of it. What I would always recommend that you do before you start to do something like a pivot table, which is what we're going to move into next, is that you format your data as a table. And on the home ribbon, you have a format as table option. Now, there's a number of different reasons why. I know this data kind of looks like it's in a table, but that's just the nature of Excel. Excel has a grid pattern, so we assume, in a way, that our data is in a table, but it's actually not, okay? Until you actually place it in a table or format it as a table, your data is just raw data in cells, okay? Now, there are lots of advantages as to why you might put your data in a table before you start to create a pivot table. So, first of all, Let's put it in a table. So I'm going to click anywhere in my table. I'm going to click on the Format as Table drop-down. And you'll see I get loads of different formats that I can use. And it doesn't matter which one you use. They all kind of do the same thing. They convert your raw data to a table. And um, I think they all give you little filter icons across the top like we've got as well. So I'm just going to select one like that. And it will say, where is the data for your table? and it will pick up your data. As long as you don't have any other data, like right next to the table, you'll get your little marching ants around the outside. If for some reason it's picked up the wrong data, then you can just go in and you can minimize that and just go in and reselect your table by clicking and dragging. Click on OK. All right, so now my data is in a table. Okay, and I can tell that because when I'm clicked in the data, if you look up to the top, you now have your table tools ribbons showing. Remember, those table tools are contextual ribbons, so they only appear when you're clicked in a table. So if I was to click outside of the table, those ribbons disappear. When I'm clicked in, I get my table tools where I can change the design and also modify various other table options. So that's how I know that my data has been successfully converted to a table. I could go in here and name this table. That's always really useful and a useful habit to get into is not just leaving all of your tables named table one. And again, if you look up on the ribbons in that first group, the properties, you can see it says table one, but it's always good to, to name your table. So I'm just going to call mine pivot, like so. It means you can reference your tables throughout your worksheets. You can also reference them if you're creating formulas instead of using the cell references. Sometimes it's a lot easier just to give the, the table name in order to specify that range of cells as well. All right, so now we have our table looking very nice. Um, on our, on our spreadsheet, we can now go in and start creating our pivot table. One of the other reasons why I also like to do this before creating pivot tables is when it comes to adding more data. If your data has not been put inside a table and then you wanted to add maybe another row on the bottom, it's not going to pick it up in the pivot table. Okay. Whereas if you put information in a table and then you add another row at the bottom, all you need to do is refresh the pivot table for it to pick up that new data. Okay. So again, it makes it a lot easier um, if you're going to be adding more data into your pivot table after creation. All right. So let's move on 
to pivot tables. Again, something which people always find a little bit scary. They're very easy though. So let's take a look at what we're going to do. I'm going to click in my data set and I'm going to go to the insert ribbon. You'll see the first little group that we have is a tables group and the first option is pivot table. So let's just click on pivot table. Actually, I'm going to do it on that data in a moment. I think I've got, yeah, let me do it on this data first of all. I'm going to come back and do a pivot table on this one, but I think it's going to be simpler if I show you on this one first. Okay, so let's click on pivot table. It says select a table or range, and you can see again, because it's the only data I have on my page, it's selected that data range for me. And then it says, where do you want to place this pivot table? And I could choose new worksheet or existing worksheet. So if you want your pivot table to be on the same page as your raw data, you could do existing. I prefer to have it on a new worksheet. I like to keep them separate. I find it a little bit less confusing. So I'm going to keep new worksheet selected. And I'm going to click on OK. And this is what you'll be presented with when you first create your pivot table. So at the moment, you can see here on the main body, we have pivot table one, and there's nothing showing at the moment. Right over on the right-hand side, we have pivot table fields, and you can see that just underneath, it's picked up the three column headings, so department, quarter, and sales. Those are the headings that we had in our raw data, department, quarter, sales. What you now need to do is build up your pivot table and drag and drop these three headings to these four areas below, depending on where you want your data to appear. This is the thing with the pivot table. It's, it, it's pretty much what it says on the tin. It's a table that can be moved around to display your data in a different way. So it's great for data analysis. Okay. So let's do a couple of combinations. I'm going to first drag department down to columns. So you can see now, it's got the four departments running across the top in columns. I'm going to drag my quarter down to rows. And now I've got quarter one, two, three, four listed in my rows. And then my main data is going to be sales. So I'm going to put that in the values area. And that puts those values in there like that. You can then start pivoting that pivot table. So if that isn't quite showing you your data how you want it, you can start playing around with your pivot tables, and that's the thing, and there's a lot of trial and error involved in pivot tables, moving fields around until you can really extract what it is that you're looking for. I'm using a very, very tiny amount of data. These are great if you've got very, very large data sets with like 50 columns, you know, even more than that, for really trying to get out what it is that you need. So I could then drag departments to rows as well and just see what that looks like. So you can see you start to see your data displayed in different ways. I could drag department to filters, so that gives us a slightly different look. So what happens here? I've got my department up here in filters. I've got my quarters and my sales just here. So I can click the drop down and select to see data only for the dance department for those quarters. Okay, so that's the filters area or put your data up in a little filter drop down like so. So it really is a matter of playing around with it to get it to produce what you want it to. But very, very simple to create. Now there's lots of things that you can do with pivot tables, and I'm not going to go into all of them because this isn't specifically a pivot tables webinar, but I do want to show you just a few little things which I think might be helpful to you. One of those is something called recommended pivot tables. So I'm just going to, I'm going to close this sheet down. Oh, I knew I was going to do that. I think I've accidentally closed down everything, so let's go back. Okay. So I'm going to create the pivot table again, but this time I'm going to use recommended pivot tables. So going back to my insert ribbon, and instead of clicking on pivot table, I'm going to click on the option next to it, recommended pivot tables. And this is really good if you're not 
sure how you want your pivot table to look. So it will give you some examples of what that pivot table is going to look like. So you can kind of look at them and think, ah, oh, is that what I want? Or maybe it's that one. Or maybe that one. So it gives you some suggestions as to how you might want to display your data. Okay, so I'm just going to use this one, sum of sales, and then when I click OK, it's going to create that pivot table that I've selected for me. And you can then go in and you can edit it and do whatever you like with your pivot table. I'm departments back into columns just by dragging and dropping it back in. Okay, so really nice and easy, and that pivot table thing is really nice. What you'll also notice is when you are working with pivot tables, we have those contextual ribbons again. So if you glance your eyes up to your ribbons, you have your pivot tables, table tools ribbon with two sub ribbons, analyze and design. So you can really go in there and start to customize your pivot table. So you can change the, the color of it. We'll have a nice little yellow as it's coming to the end of summer. And you can do things like play around with the, the grand total, subtotals, things like that. So just to highlight this a little bit better, I'm just going to drag department across to rows again. Because you can see here, um, we've got it split down by, in fact, I'm going to put department above, quarter. That's what I want it to look like. So we've got our different departments, balance, dance, play, sports, so on and so forth. And then we've got our, our sales. And we've got some subtotals here. So the subtotals are showing at the top currently. Now, I don't know about you, but I tend to, when I'm reading data, I like my totals to be at the bottom as opposed to at the top. So if you do find that you've got data that looks like that, you can go to your design ribbon and you can adjust using the subtotals button where you want them to appear. So I want mine to appear at the bottom of the group and you'll see now it switches that down to the bottom of those groups. I just think that's a bit nicer to read. But again, it's personal preference. We have a grand total at the bottom and you have a grand totals option as well. So you can turn it off if you, want, if you don't want it there or you can have it only for rows, only for columns. So lots of little options in there that you can also play around with and customize. Jumping across to the Analyze tab in our Pivot Tables tool ribbon, you'll see in that very last group, the Show group, we have three buttons, and they're all currently grayed out or highlighted, I should say. So we have Field List, Plus, Minus, and Field Headers. So Field List, if I click on it, it takes away the pivot table fields on the right-hand side. I can't tell you how many calls I used to get about this on the help desk where people were like, my pivot table fields have disappeared and I don't know how to get them back. And it was literally just a matter of clicking back on your field list. Alternatively, you can click back in your pivot table, she says. Oh, it's not being kind to me today. Normally when you click back in your pivot table, it will appear again. But if not, you've got your field list just there as well. Okay. You've also got your plus and minus buttons, so these take effect when you have grouping applied. So grouping was automatically applied by nature of the way that I've arranged my department and my quarter in my rows. So you can see here I have little minuses. So these are collapsible and expandable. So if I click that, it collapses that up. So it allows me just to kind of get rid of the noise and just focus in on what it is that I want to look at. And if I don't want those there, or maybe I'm sending this pivot table to someone else and I don't want them to start playing around with that, I can remove those buttons just by clicking on the plus minus buttons. It just, it just gets rid of them. And the same thing with field headers as well. If you just want to get rid of the header up there, you can click that also. So a few different things that you can do. Now, I did mention also that when you are creating your pivot table from your raw data, if you want to add um, more data in, sorry, this one here, um, so maybe some more data into the bottom here, like another column or another row, and you want the pivot table to pick that data up, you need to do two things. The first thing you do is need to make sure that you format your raw data as a table, which is what we did initially. When you add your new data in, it will add a new row into that table. However, it doesn't automatically update the pivot table. You have to manually do that yourself by clicking the refresh key. Okay? So if you click in your data and then using your pivot table tools, go up to uh, analyze and you'll see there is a refresh button in the middle there. 
So when you click Refresh All, that will do a quick refresh and pick up any new information that's been added in that raw data. So just remember that it's not an automatic process. Excuse me, just had a quick swig of water. Lovely. Now I'm going to move my department back to columns. A couple of other little tricks before we move on to the next item. Um, there's lots of things that you can also do with this data once it's in the pivot table. So for example, if you right click, you have a few different options. So you have things like sorts. If you want to sort your data, so um, from smallest to largest, largest to smallest, you can sort within the pivot table as well. And you can do things like, um, where are we, summarize values by. So currently, it's set to sum. So I'm getting my totals in here for each of these departments. But it might be that I want to see the average. So if I select average, it's now showing me the average for all of these. Okay? You don't have to highlight the whole lot. It will just do it. So again, summarize values by, maybe I want to see the maximum value. So you'll see now here, 64682, that's the maximum value in this list of data. So max, min will show you the minimum. You could do count. Count's not really relevant for this though because we've only got four, so it's just going to show you four. So there are ways that you can kind of add little formulas within your pivot table without doing anything to the underlying raw data. Okay. And I'm just going to switch that back to sum. And another little one that I quite like is along the same lines, if you right click in your data, you can also show values as, and then you have various different options. So one that's quite popular is show values as a percentage of the grand total. So if I click that, you'll see it converts all my totals, and it's showing me now as a percentage of the grand total. Okay? So I can see that all together, the sales for the dance uh, department make up 21.72 of all total sales. And I can see the breakdown of that per quarter as well. Okay, so that's quite a nice one as well. And there's lots of options in that show value as. Again, you're not doing anything to the underlying raw data. It's just a way of extracting and analyzing um, effectively in your pivot table. Now, I did mention at the start as well about building uh, dashboards. And again, this is something that's kind of popular. I keep seeing these popping up all the time with people building these fancy dashboards. And Excel's so good, you can start to really build a lot of activity into um, your spreadsheets. Unfortunately, I won't be able to show a lot of it today, but hopefully I'll show you enough to give you a little flavor of some of the things that you can do. So I'm just going to take those calculations off. And we're just going to create a very basic, I'm going to create a chart, so you can add that into your, to your pivot table, and then we're going to add in some slices, so fun little things which were introduced in Excel 2010. So, if you have a pivot table, we can now create a pivot chart to make that data come alive, make it a little bit more visual. In general, people respond to and remember visual items more than just a wall of numbers. So it is quite nice to put your data into a chart format wherever possible. So I'm going to click in my data, and then on my Pivot Table Tools Analyze ribbon, I have a Pivot Charts option as well. So it takes me to the Insert Chart, and I have all these different charts that I could add in if I wanted to. So again, it really depends what it is that you're looking for. And a lot of these are new for 2016. For example, the, the waterfall chart, I think, is new for 2016. And the box and whisker chart, which I'd never heard of before, but uh, it sounds pretty, pretty funny to me. Uh, I think that's new for 2016 as well. But I'm just going to use a boring old clustered column chart. And I'm going to click on OK. And there we go. So immediately, I now have my data displayed. I have my quarters running across the bottom. I have my departments in my legend. And then I have my, my sales, my sum of sales at the top there. And I can, again, with these drop downs, I can interact with my chart. So if I don't want to see everything on there, maybe just balance and dance, I can click OK and I can display it like that. So it really kind of brings these elements to life. And it's particularly good if you're sending it to other people. They can use it and they can draw out the data that they need. So I'm just going to select all of those again. 
And I'm going to put that underneath my pivot table so it looks all nice and neat. And remember that you do have, when you click on your chart, again, you have those contextual ribbons, your pivot chart tools at the top. Now, charts have three sub-ribbons. You've got analyze, design, and format. Okay, so you can change the design to whatever you want it to be. You can switch the rows and columns around. You can even change the chart type from here if you wanted to switch to a pie chart or something along those lines. Formatting, again, just mainly relates to, to the color of things and drawing shapes. And then your analyze, um, you've got some other little items on here which you can add in. And we're going to add in some of these in a moment. You might want to do things like format your chart, so add an axis, things like that. And you'll have these two little buttons next to your chart as well. So if I click the plus, what's ticked, it's currently showing me what is applied. So if I want to add axes titles, I can click like that. And you can see now it gives me a little, it's basically a text box, and I can delete that out and I can add in uh, quarters, like so. And the same thing down the side if I want to, sales. Okay, so you can go in, you can customize your chart however you want. So that's quite nice. What I'm also going to add in now are some slicers, and slicers are kind of like filters, but a more visual way of using filters, and again, they're a great way of creating an interactive dashboard so that people can make sense of large amounts of data. So I'm going to make sure that I'm clicked in my data, and I'm going to go back to that Analyze sub-ribbon, and you'll see right in the middle we have a filter group. And we have two options, Insert Slicer and Insert Timeline. So let's go to Insert Slicer. And again, it's going to pick up your, depart your headings, or your data headings. So it depends what you want to allow people to filter by. So I'm going to say, I'm going to apply a filter for department and quarter. And what you'll get are two little slicers, like so, which you can move and you can make look a little bit tidier, because remember we are building like a nice little interactive dashboard, so we want everything to be nice and neat. And if you glance your eyes up, you'll see we have the slicer tools contextual ribbon now with various different options, so I might want to make these a different color, like so. So what the person can then do, or whoever it is that you're sending this to, is they can just say, right, I want to see all the figures for the dance department for quarter two and both of the things update, so your pivot table and your pivot chart. Okay? If you want to select more than one, just hold down the control key as you select the next one. So you can see, as I'm doing that, it's building up. Okay? So it's just a really nice interactive way or ways to, way to interact with your, with your data. Now, also in there was a timeline slicer. Um, this thing here, or insert timeline it's called. This works in a slightly different way, and it can only be used on um, data that is a date, okay? Now, in my data for the pivot table we've just done, I didn't have any uh, dates in my raw data. So it's basically this data I'm using. None of these are dates. So I'm gonna create another pivot table uh, based on this data just here. All right, so let's just very quickly create another pivot table so I can show you that timeline because we do have date data in here. So we can use that timeline slicer. So very quickly, and this is just a good little reminder on creating a pivot table again. I'm going to go to my insert ribbon. I'm going to select pivot table. I'm going to click OK to put it on a new worksheet. And I'm going to add some very basic data. So I'm going to drag the department down to uh, rows. Uh, actually, I'm not going to use department. I'm going to use employee name and salary, shall we say. Oh, no, that's not good. Values, that's better. So just added some basic data there. But if I want to use the insert timeline, I'm going to click insert timeline from the Analyze ribbon, and it only presents me with columns that contain dates. And in this data set, the only column that contains a date is the higher date. So I'm going to use that and click OK. 
and it gives you this slicer that's slightly different to the other ones that we were looking at, and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. This is called a timeline slicer, and you can basically drag and drop it. It's a different way of displaying to show the higher date range that you want to display in your pivot table. So maybe I just want to show people who were hired between May and October, or maybe I want to adjust that to May to July, and you'll see that my pivot table data changes as I drag my timeline slicer in and out. Okay, so it is very slightly different, but it is another way of making one of those interactive dashboards in Excel. Lovely. Now, I'm going to move on because, as usual, we've got about sort of eight minutes left, and as usual, I am running slightly behind because I just love to talk to you so much. I tend to rabbit on. So let's move on to the next thing. I definitely want to show you some of these, uh, what we call what-if analysis tools. And the first one that I'm going to show you is something called Goal Seek. And again, this is a really good one to use for extracting out data that you need. Now, the first thing that I'm going to use, or the first example, is um, if you can just ignore the large data set just here, I'm going to be using this over here. So I'm just highlighting the tiny little bit of data I'm using in this first example. So um, Goal Seek is a way of working something out when, you, when something changes, which I know doesn't make much sense, but hopefully when I show you the, the example, it will. So here, this information is basically information for a car loan. So, for example, I want to buy a car that's twenty-four thousand pounds. I want to, or I want to borrow twenty-four thousand pounds over sixty months at a rate of three point five percent. And Excel has worked out that that means per month I will be paying four hundred and thirty-seven pounds because the the underlying formula that's going on here, if you look in the formula bar is the PMT or the payment formula, okay? Um, and that does a calculation. You, you don't need to know too much about that. I'm not going into PMT too much in this session, but that's worked out that I'm going to be paying £437 a month. Now, maybe I had set aside £500 a month, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, I have £500. How much does that mean I can borrow? Maybe I can borrow more if I'm going to be paying £500 back. So what we can use Goal Seek for is we can tell it, change this to 500 and tell me how much I can borrow. Okay? So I'm going to click in my payment area and I'm going to go to my data ribbon. You'll find all of these analysis tools underneath the forecast group in the What If Analysis drop-down, and in there we have Goal Seek. So it says Set Cell, so M4, this is the one that I'm interested in, so I want to, to value would be 500, okay, because that's how much I want to change that to. And it's saying, okay, by changing which cell, which cell are you interested in? So it could be that um, I want to borrow more, or maybe I want to pay back over a longer period of time, or maybe I can adjust the rate. You can adjust any of these. So I'm going to select sell because I want to borrow more. And then I'm going to click OK. And there we go. It works out that if I'm paying £500 a month, I can borrow £27,485. So that is what your goal seek will allow you to do. I'm going to show you two more examples just to kind of get it in your brain. Um, and I apologize if I am going quick. As I said, we are running out of time. The other example for goal seek is one here. And this is for test scores. So we've had tests 1 to 7. Haven't done test 7 yet. And you can see my scores out of 100 for each of my tests. So I'm averaging currently a test score of 88 out of 100, which I think is pretty good. However, I'm going for an A. And to get an A, I need an average of 89.5. So I want to know what do I need to score on my final test in order to achieve that A grade. And again, that's where I can use Goal Seek. So I'm going to go back to What If Analysis, select Goal Seek. My value, I want, I'm aiming for 89.5. By changing, so I can select this blank cell. That is where I want the information to go. Oops. 
What have I done there? Let me do that again. So 89.5. Hmm. It's happened to me earlier. I don't know what I was doing wrong. Let's try that again. There we go. I think I was just clicked in the wrong cell. Now, it looks like it's going through and doing some really, really complicated formulas, and eventually it does get to kind of what you need. So I now know that I need to score 98.5 in my final test in order to achieve the average and that A grade. Okay? And very finally, in our large data set here, I can see staff salaries and new salaries. So there's a, uh, they've had their salaries increased by a rate of 2.7, which I've got in uh, cell J1 just here. And you can see over here in row 01, that is the budget that I have for all staff salaries. So maybe I've come in under budget. Maybe my budget was 39 million. So I want to increase everybody's salary or change that percentage rate when this becomes 39 million. And again, I can use Goal Seek for doing that. So let's go to Goal Seek. To value 39 million by changing cell, I'm going to change the percentage. And again, there we go. So now you can see that the percentage increase is 3%, and that's fed through to everybody's salaries, and it's put it up to 39 million. So it's really good for things like that. Hopefully, those three examples kind of give you an idea of the things that you can do with that. Okay, moving on to scenarios. Now, again, this is something which you can, you can use. Um, this is a, an example of budget projections. So for 2017, we've got our projected sales, shipping, uh, various different things that we have. And maybe I want to be able to easily see what this is going to look like, what this data looks like if we've had very low sales or if we've had very high sales, what do my overall figures look like if we've had a really bad year or a really good year? And we call those scenarios, the different scenarios. And you can set them all up and very easily switch between your different scenarios. So this is our current data, and it's always good to set your current data as kind of your normal scenarios. So this is how things normally look, and then add scenarios in for bad year, good year, essentially. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up my first scenario. And again, we go back to our what if analysis. We go down to scenario manager. And we add in a new scenario. And I'm going to call this one normal. So and it's going to say, OK, so what cells are you interested in? So I'm going to delete out this. Now, when I create my low scenario or bad year scenario, I'm going to be judging that based on sales and shipping and the cost of goods and things like that. So I'm just going to select the cells that I'm interested in. So I'm going to say I'm interested in sales, uh, shipping, goods, freight, miscellaneous. And I'm going to click on OK. OK, so these figures that it's pulled in, these are my normal figures. So if we're having just like a regular year, nothing too drastic, nothing too low, nothing too high with regards to sales, this is what my figures normally look like. This is our normal scenario. I'm then going to add in two more scenarios. So the first one is going to be a low scenario. So if our sales are really low, I'm going to keep those same cells selected. And this is where I'm going to say, OK, so for, for the first cell here, which is cell B5, which is, relates to sales, I consider low sales to be 120,000. So I'm going to change that to say low sales is 120,000. And you can go through and you can set up your scenarios, essentially. What is a low scenario to you? What is a high scenario? Those kinds of things. Like so. And then you can add one in and do the same for high. 
and I might say that uh, if we get 160,000, that's a particularly high year that we're having. Okay, so again, you can add in your numbers. I'm not going to add in all of them and click on OK. So you then have your three scenarios, and you can from here show them. So if I click on the Show button whilst I've got High selected, it's going to adjust all my figures for me in my budget projections spreadsheet. If I go to Low and click Show, again, it's going to adjust those figures in my budget projections spreadsheet. Now, also, what I like to do is if I do have scenarios set up, is I like them to be easily accessible. I don't want to have to come into Scenario Manager and come into here in order to see my figures. So what, in general, I will do is I will add them to the Quick Access Toolbar. So I'm going to click the little drop-down on your Quick Access. I'm going to go to More Commands. And I'm going to find the Scenarios option. So Scenarios is on the Data ribbon. So I'm just going to select Data tab. And everything's in alphabetical order in here. So we should be able to find Scenario Manager. And I'm going to add it to my Quick Access Toolbar. And you see here it's in a little round dot. So when I click on it, it jumps me straight to my Scenarios. And I can very then quickly jump to it that way. Okay, so it's a nice quick way of adding that in. Okay, so those are scenarios, high, low, and normal. I'm probably going to run for about five more minutes. If you need to jump off the call because we are running over slightly, then please do. Um, if you want to stay to the end, as I said, I'm only probably going to be about five more minutes, so bear with me. All right, so moving on to uh, data tables. And again, this is a nice quick way of being able to get your, your data in um, very nice and quickly. Now, I have in this cell just here, so in B3, another one of those PMT formulas, so a payment formula. And I want to apply this formula across the rest of these cells. Okay, so for example, um, what will my payment be? if I'm borrowing 200,000 at a rate of 3%, and so on and so forth, okay? So all you need to do is create the, the formula once, and then you can add it into the data table very quickly. So I'm going to click on B3, and then I'm going to go to What If Analysis and Data Table. So it says Row Input Cell. Sorry, I was <laughs> row input cell is B1 and column input cell is B1. And then when you click on OK, oops, I am clicking in the wrong place today with my highlight. You need to highlight where you want to copy that formula to essentially. So I'm going to highlight here, what if, let's just do that again. Go to data table and select my inputs. Oh, nothing's working for me today. Oops. I did this to me yesterday. I got lots of dashes in there for some reason. Oh, I know why. Because I haven't copied in the formula, have I? I haven't selected the formula. Sorry, that was my fault. I was selecting just my cell range here, but I need to select the cell which actually contains the formula that I want to copy down. Sorry, that's my fault. That's better. And then go to data table. Okay, so let's put our inputs in again. So A1 and B1. <laughs> she says. <laughs> Yeah, something's not quite working right here. I might have to come back to that one. I don't know what is going on there. Let me come back to that because that's not what I was expecting to see. Just bear with me. Let's move on to VLOOKUPs quickly and then we can jump back to data tables because I don't know if I've got some something funny in there. All right, VLOOKUPs. These tend to be, again, a tool that you will use all the time. So... Formulas that are really popular, a VLOOKUP, HLOOKUP, and HLOOKUP is exactly the same as a VLOOKUP. It just means that your data is running horizontally as opposed to vertically. That's what the V and the H stand for in VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP. 
And all we're doing is it just means that we're looking up data from another table and putting it into the table that we're currently using. So for VLOOKUPs to work, the one thing that you need is you need to have common data shared between the two tables in order to look it up. So in this example, we have a product list. And you can see here we've got product, color, price, whether it's in stock, sold, revenue, so on and so forth. We need to complete the department and the category. I have another table. Now, my table happens to be on the same worksheet, but it could be in a completely different Excel spreadsheet, um, or it could be on a different tab. And you can see that this shows the product and the department and the category that that product is part of. Okay, so what I want to do is essentially reference this table of data over here and this column to get my department and this column to get my category. And we do that by using VLOOKUP. Now, what I would always recommend you do here is name your tables because it is a lot easier to do as opposed to um, constantly using cell references. So before we start the session, I've actually named both of my tables. So I just highlighted the table and then in here, you want to type in a name for your table. Uh, but that hasn't taken either. I'm having so many problems today with these spreadsheets. I don't know why those have disappeared. <laughs> so let's do it again. So I'm highlighting my first table. And you just need to give it a name. So I'm going to call this products and press enter. I'm going to do the same here. So I can pr press control A to quickly highlight all of my data. And I'm going to call this, um, let's call it lookup. So now I have both of my tables named. And that's just going to make it a lot easier for you when you're doing your formula because you can reference the table name as opposed to the cells. So to construct your VLOOKUP, we're going to click in department and we're going to click on the equals sign. And we're then going to type in VLOOKUP. I'm going to open my bracket. And again, you can see the little tooltip is telling us what it is that we need to type in. So the first one is the lookup value. So what is it that you want to look up? So this will be the common data that appears in both tables. So that is the product in this case. So I'm going to click on A6. I then need to put a comma in. And you can see now bolded is what I need to type in next. So the table array. So it's saying, where do you, which table do you want me to look in? So here, I can type in the name of my table. Now, if, you are, if you've named your tables, if you press the F3 key on your keyboard, it will bring up a little pop-up with all of the names of your tables, and you can just select it. Now, unfortunately, when we're on webinars, for some reason, the F3 key um, adjusts the volume. So it must be something to do with my headset plugged in. So just remember that you can do that, press the F3 key. So I'm going to have to type it in. And I called our table um, lookup, like so. And you can see it's highlighted the table, so I know that that's correct. It then says, what column am I looking at? So your columns go from one, two, three from the first column. So the product column is considered one, department two, category three. So I'm pulling back the department, so I want to say number two. And then finally on the end, you have two options, two arguments, true or false. And you can see there it's telling me true is an approximate match, false is an exact match. And this is quite important. So we're doing an exact match. I want it to exactly match the words bamboo armchair in that list. So my last argument is going to be false. And then I'm going to close that bracket and press enter. And it's pullback furniture. I can then use my autofill by double clicking to fill down. We're going to do the same thing again for category. So I'm going to click, I'm going to do equals, VLOOKUP, open brackets, lookup value again is the product, comma, table array, you can press F3 or type in the name of the table, like so. Comma, column index number, so this time we're looking up category, so it's going to be three, and we want an exact match, so false. And there we go. So a very quick way of doing a VLOOKUP with an exact match. 
The exact match refers to that true-false on the end. So the next example I want to show you is just the opposite of that. So when you're doing an approximate match, okay? So very quickly, I'm going to click in this reduction column. And you can see here we have order number, item cost, subtotals, and adjusted totals. And I have a table here called reduction rate. So I'm going to name this table. So highlight it and call it reduction. And we're going to perform a VLOOKUP. So equals VLOOKUP. Now it's saying what is the lookup value. So I am basically looking up the subtotal in this table. And then depending where that subtotal falls is going to give me the amount of reduction that is required in here. Okay. Now you can see here we're going to be using an approximate match, that true argument. Because if you take a look, £1,363.80 there isn't that exact value in here. It's between 1,000 and 1,500. This is where you use that true option, when the, the data that you're looking up doesn't exactly match where you're looking it up in the table. So I'm going to say lookup value is D3. My table array is reduction, which is the name of that table. The column index number, I'm looking up I want it to return the percentage, so that's going to be column number two. And the range lookup needs to be true because it's an approximate match. And there you can see it gives me 3% because 1,363 is in between these two. And again, you can double-click to fill down. Okay, so that's the difference between the two lookups that you can use. Now, we have run about a quarter of an hour over. Um, I do have if statements to show you as well, which I will try and squeeze in very quickly for those of you who are just hanging on. I do apologize. Um, I do want to show you this very, very briefly. So, um, yeah, there's definitely something wrong with my spreadsheets today because this data shouldn't be there. It's having a little meltdown. It knows it's the, the end of the day, I think. So if statements are another formula, and it's the last formula I'm going to show you today, don't worry. Um, another formula which is really good at quickly extracting data out for you. So again, we have a list of products, and what we need to find out is the shipping costs. And you can see just above that table, it says that there's no shipping charge for orders over $1,500. For everything else, there's a 2% of the cost charge, so we need to work that out, and we do that using an if statement. Let's click in where it says shipping, and we're going to use our if, oops, we're going to use equals first, and then if, and open our brackets. So what we want to say is it's asking me for the logical test. So my logical test is if this cost and I want to say it is greater than or equal to 1,500 because we're worried about orders equal to or over 1,500. So if it's greater than or equal to 1,500, that's the logical test, comma, and it's asking me, okay, so if it is, what do you want me to do? And then it's going to ask me, if it's not, what do you want me to do? So if that is true, if that value is equal to or greater than 1500, I want you to do nothing, okay, because there's no shipping charge for those orders. However, if that's false, I want you to work out what 2% of that cost is and add it on, okay? So I'm going to do total cost times 2%, and then close the bracket, and there we go. And again, I can copy that down. So you should see that wherever there's a dash in there, those items are over 1,500, so there's no shipping cost in there. All right, so that is your if statement. As I said, go back and review this in the video because I am aware that I am going quite fast. The first I want to show you are count if and sum if, and again, these are really useful as well. These will just say, for example, um, if this data is over 1,500, so again, whatever criteria you give it, I'm going to count it. So maybe you just want to count how many rows contain that data, something along those lines. So we can use 
countif for that. Open bracket. So we've got the range. So that's going to be um, F1. So it's the whole table, basically. Uh, also not the whole table. The whole row here of the total cost. So F7, and I know it's down to F915 is the last row. It's quite a large table that we have. So I want to say if that total cost is, and we need to put this in speech marks, greater than 1500, then count it. So I know that there's 516 rows that are over, or 516 items, I should say, that are over 1,500. You can use sum if in the same way, except it's not going to count the number of rows. It's going to sum everything together. So it's going to pick out those costs based on your criteria and add them all together. And that is the difference between sum if and count if. So if we just quickly do a sum if, and it's the same format. So I'm going to do F7 to F915, which is the last one. I'm going to do a comma, and then I'm going to say, so whenever you find anything that's over 1500, I want you to sum it together. So we should get a rather large number there. Okay, so that's all of these which are over 1500 added together. Those are the formulas which my team advised me were the ones which they use most often when it comes to data analysis. I'm sorry about that data table. I'm not quite sure what happened there. I'm going to have to have a look. But a lot of the data that I'd set up just before the session doesn't seem to have saved. So I don't know if something a bit strange has gone on. So I do apologize about that. But hopefully um, you did pick up some little tips. So I think without further ado, because we are running over by quite a bit, I will jump to James for any questions that we have. The the only question we had, let me, can you hear me? Is that any better? Right, one moment. This is really... I think James is having a few problems with his uh, microphone if you can't hear him. I'm not sure if you can hear him or me. <laughs> is that any better? I can't hear you, but as long as everybody else can, then, then that's fine. Uh, if anybody can hear me, if they could just pop that in the questions box for or the chat. Or the chat. Yes. yes. Great. Okay. okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, um, yeah, the only yeah, question... Yeah, question... Oh, in Ooh. fact... We have, uh, uh, if anybody would like a recording of the webinar, since I've seen that immediately, if they could just leave their email address uh, in the questions or the chat, uh, I can get back to you um, as soon as possible. It'd probably be tomorrow now. Uh, so just go ahead and, and pop your email address down there. Uh, another question that somebody asked Eloise Barmer, she was wondering, if there was a way for her to total values in a spreadsheet, which were payments, so if they were, uh, if they had a currency in in the cell along with the the price. If they had a, so for I'm not sure what you mean. If, if there was a risk, if there was just a list of prices, but they all had the currency for the prices. She seemed to, to believe uh, that she couldn't add them together with the currency in the cell. She had to go through and manually delete. So different currencies are you talking about? So you might have pounds and dollars all mixed up together. Is that is that what we're we're talking yeah. about here? Yeah. Um, it, I mean, Excel will treat it regardless of what the currency symbol is. It will treat it as, as numbers, and it will add up those numbers. But with regards to, I mean, you know, if you're adding up dollars and pounds, I'm not quite sure why you would do that, but if you have a requirement for that, as far as I'm aware, Excel should just treat that as, um, and let's give it a little test. So let's say we've got 10 pounds. Oops. Okay. 
and hopefully this is what you mean, and then something like $20, is that what you mean? So let's change the currency symbol to, I don't know, to something else. And let's do a quick, let's see, hang on, let me move that out of the way. Yeah, so it, it, it will add it, um, but, you know, and you can then just go in and change the currency symbol to whatever you want or remove it completely. But, yeah, it should just treat them as numbers regardless of what the, the currency symbol is. Hopefully that's answered your question. <laughs> right, that is perfect. Uh, I think that that is all of the questions, uh, actually, and uh, probably not a moment too late. <laughs> Yes, I apologise for running so far over. <laughs> no, it's, I, I'm sure everybody's just pleased to learn more. Um, yes, so thank you very much, Deb. Uh, it, it was great. Um, I hope everybody who's listened can forgive the slight technical hitch we had. Uh, in my furious envy for Deb's Excel abilities, I decided to momentarily hijack the, hijack the broadcaster's presenter. Uh, in all seriousness, I really enjoyed the live class today, so thank you again, Deb. Uh, that was great, and thank you to the listener, or the, the listeners rather. The webinar is going to end here, so enjoy the rest of the day wherever you are, and thanks again. Good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everybody.